Now, being only 22, financially dependent, fresh out of college, he had to ask his dad's permission, and he was turned down. His father had many reasons, and Darwin jotted these reasons down, and this is a copy of the, that original document of Darwin's notes of his father's objections to this voyage, a little easier to read in, in this version. So what were his father's objections? Well, that this voyage would be disreputable to his character as a clergyman hereafter, that it was a wild scheme, that they, the Navy, must have offered the job to many others before him, the place of naturalist. This was true. Darwin was not the first choice. Um, because it was not accepted, there must be something wrong with the vessel or the expedition, that he would never settle down to a steady life hereafter, that his accommodations would be most uncomfortable. This was definitely true. Um, that he, Dr. Darwin, would consider it as again changing his profession. He had switched once from medicine to the clergy. And it would be an utterly useless undertaking. And Darwin, in a systematic manner that would sort of be his whole approach to life, not as well as science, but even marriage, he worked on a rebuttal, a point-by-point -point rebuttal of each of these objections, consulted with his uncle, and was able to finally persuade his father to let him go. So at just age 22, he set off on a voyage that was planned to be a two-year voyage around the world. It wound up taking five. So he left England and never saw his family for five full years. Most of that time spent on a rickety wooden boat called the HMS Beagle in cramped quarters, experiencing storms at sea, earthquakes in ports, and for Darwin, seasickness for the entire voyage. That queasy stomach haunted him not only from medical school through this voyage, but his entire adult life. So off they went. And on board, with these relatively limited amount of space, Darwin had to figure carefully what was he going to take on this voyage. Well, he brought supplies that a naturalist would need. He brought pickling jars, and he brought notebooks, and he brought all sorts of uh, pens and pencils and things to draw specimens, and uh, other supplies he needed to ship specimens home, because he was going to carry all this stuff for this multi-year voyage with him. He was going to ship some of it back on British ships that were going home, that they passed on the sea routes. Well, among the things he had, one of the most important were a couple of books. One book was Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, a brand new book at the time that offered a pretty dramatically new vision of geology from uh, the wisdom of the recent decades. And Darwin uh, was very keen on geology. He had a lot of experience at, while at Cambridge of going across the English countryside, which has lots of interesting geological formations, and Darwin took extra care to learn about them. The second book he had with him was the Holy Bible. Darwin, who was going to study for the clergy, considered this book his authoritative reference on all matters of morality. And he would quote on, on board ship, literally, directly from the Bible, and, and read to the, some of the sailors. Now, the geological background Darwin had and his grasp of geology was absolutely critical to his future success as a naturalist. This is one element that he had running through his brain that other naturalists of the time perhaps did not. What Darwin understood from reading Lyell and from some of his personal experiences was that landforms change. That was a relatively new idea at the time. Secondly, he began to understand the immensity of time, that the earth was much older than he had been first led to think. So just those ideas were percolating in his mind as he started to voyage around the world. And one of the topics he first started to think about, prompted by, by seeing interesting landforms as they passed by in the HMS Beagle, was how do some of these forms actually uh, develop? And I'm showing you here a picture from the Pacific Ocean of a series of islands. Uh, the few in the background are atolls, so they are just uh, little lagoons surrounded by rings of coral. And in the foreground, you see a pretty familiar-looking island, again, surrounded by a coral ring. Now, at the time, and reading Lyell, the thought on how coral reefs formed was that every coral reef, when you saw an atoll like that, that th that was coral that had been built on the edge of a volcanic crater. But Darwin thought this was really unlikely. That, you know, underneath the sea, are you telling me there's just volcano after volcano after volcano just packed right up against each other? He just didn't think that was right. And so he thought about this more, and he knew that 
major landforms would sink under their weight, that land, um, landforms would change over time. And he thought, no, I don't think that coral reefs are all built on the ridges of volcanic craters. In fact, when I look at the different types of coral reefs that exist in the world, I see this as all different stages of the same process. And Darwin's first great theory wasn't about animals and organisms at all. It was about the formation of coral reefs. And this was his model. His idea was that when, for example, a volcanic island was tossed up out of the ocean and the corals would grow around the shallow water surrounding that island, that would form what would be called a fringing reef. And then, as the land mass started to sink, shown here in the center of the slide, a lagoon would form between the outside reef and the land, and that outside reef would be a barrier reef. And then as the land sank completely out of sight, that's when you would have these atolls formed. So different stages of the same process. So long before the book for which he's most famous, Darwin wrote an entire book on the structure and distribution of coral reefs, putting forth his first great theory. And this turned out, while it was very contentious for decades, to be right. And what this demonstrated was Darwin's ability to theorize on a grand scale, to take a few observations, ruminate on them, stretch his mind a little bit more, go out of the boundaries of conventional thinking, and come up with a grand explanation, in this case, for the for entire range of coral reefs that we see in the world. Now, what did he see in terms of living forms? Well, Darwin's voyage took him to lots of interesting places, and as soon as he got the opportunity to get off that boat, he went. He got on horseback by whatever way necessary. He probed the deep uh, jungles of South America. And in these jungles, he was absolutely delighted, absolutely um, in heaven, to be studying all these vibrantly colored and diverse forms. But there were some strange things, things that started to make him think about nature in a different way. What did he see? He saw flightless birds. Now, that's peculiar. Every bird he had seen in England could fly had good, fully functional wings. But he saw flightless birds. He also found in the rocks, as he uh, looked very carefully at the geology of every area, he found fossils. In this case, for example, a giant fossil ground sloth. Now, he knew there were sloths in South America, and he saw these sloths, but these fossil sloths, they were huge. They were cow-sized, much bigger, and as Darwin started to appreciate, older than anything he saw around in South America at the time. So this is starting to plant some seeds. Then, of course, he continued on around west coast of South America to the Galapagos Islands. And he saw some very unusual creatures there that prompted a lot of his thinking. And we have a little video about those animals. Swimming lizards, the famous marine iguanas, giant tortoises large enough for Darwin to ride. They were also a good source of meat. Seals, seals that were so tame, you could, the sailors could walk right up to them. They had no predators, so they had no fear of man. And, of course, the finches. So as Darwin started to piece this together, he started to develop the notion that maybe, contrary to what he had been taught, not just landforms change, but species change. And so as he returned home to England, with thoughts of flightless birds and giant ancient ground sloths and strange lizards of what he had seen over the course of five years. And really, from that voyage of five years, he had enough questions to last him five decades, and it was five incredible decades of work that followed. Darwin, when he returned to England, started a, a phase that he refers to in his own autobiography as mental rioting. What, what was the meaning of all these things he had seen? He had seen many more things than any naturalist before him. He had studied these things very carefully. He had had five years to think about them, all that time on the ship, for example. But he knew that this idea about species changing was dangerous. It was heresy. It was absolutely contrary to the doctrine of the Anglican Church at the time. So Darwin knew he theorized at great risk. So he kept his thoughts private, and he started writing in secret notebooks. He lettered these notebooks. As he finished one, he went on to the next. So we see, we, these are actual specimens of Darwin's original notebooks. 